It gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, our keynote address speaker for tonight, Father Ian Kerr, who, who will deliver the keynote address uh, on the issue of uh, Newman the Radical Conservative. But before Father Kerr uh, delivers his speech, I'd like to first um, introduce Professor uh, Pile, Vice Chancellor and Director of Liverpool Hope University. Professor Pile. It's a great joy to, to have you at the university, and many guests from abroad as well. Um, and we're better a place to stop and reflect about the blessed John Henry Newman. Um, our first founding college um, was established in Liverpool eight years uh, before he gave those important lectures across the pond. Um, in 1832, it dawns on the English consciousness that um, children of working class families should be educated at all, 1832. Our first college, that, uh, the first of three colleges that come to be what we are today, uh, was established in 1844. And in 1856, the Notre Dame sisters come to Liverpool at the invitation of Father Nugent, who writes to the sisters in Belgium saying, here is the mo second most important e economic centre in the British Empire. Here is Liverpool, and I have 23,000 uh, children roaming the street. Come and help me. That's the context in which um, uh, uh, Cardinal Newman is trying in Ireland to establish his Oxford. Because in 1844, there were only six universities in England, two of them were medieval, and women couldn't go to them, neither could Catholics or Jews. And that's not so long ago in this England of ours that um, what we, of whom we speak at this conference um, touches our lives still here, not just in Liverpool, but in Britain. Um, so... You will be taking his theology seriously, like it should. But we here at this university reflect very much about the idea of the university. We keep drawing our inspiration from it. And you know that in that famous um, collection of discourses, he speaks about the storm from the north. And he was referring, as you know, to the um, Edinburgh Review, that was arguing, as Locke in fact did this much earlier, for a more utilitarian position in university life, in spite of there being so few. And he speaks about the storm from the north. And Yaroslav Pelikan, that great um, early church scholar at Yale, he wrote a book to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the collection of essays, and he said, well, the storm doesn't just come from the north any longer. It comes from the north and the south, and from the east and the west. Because it, it, this utilitarianism, or this pragmatism, uh, comes at, those, at the university, and those of us who hold to the ideals of a university, from all sides now, and yet, uh, Pelican was right. And more so, as we have chosen in this country to do what no government has done and create and contrive a market almost overnight within 18 months of the new government, we not only have tri tripled the fees, but we've actually withdrawn the teaching grant for all subjects except certain STEM subjects, which means the liberal arts and the humanities and such like are not funded by the taxpayer anymore, all in one stroke. And not even Mrs. Thatcher in the 80s would have countenanced such a position. And so um, what we were warned, warned about in 1852 is a very, very real issue. It's not a threat anymore. And those of us that belong to places like this that are determined to be countercultural, to create, as Andy Newman imagined, education as an end in itself, um, to provide the formation that we theologians understand, uh, a th formation of the whole person, and to create a context where that may be re re really possible. 
A place like Hope is determined to do that, irrespective of which government comes in and irrespective of the vagaries of different governments that come and go. Um, a beehive, as bees living and doing what they do normally, they don't live in a beehive to make honey. That's what they do normally. And the beehive, uh, the beehive, unlike a herd, has a certain internal rhythm and harmony that is fundamental to the life of a hive, which I think replicates what a university must be and should be. We're not just a conglomeration of various specialisms. Uh, we try to be a serious community holding to this notion that Henry, John Henry Newman talks about at length in, in his book. Um, that, of course, it does produce honey and sweetens the world. It's a wonderful outcome of any good university. But that's not the function by which we set out to establish a university. And so you can see why your, your topic and what Father Kerr uh, specialized in, and I'm delighted to, to have him on campus to open the conference. And thank you, Dr. Kelly, for getting him. He's a very busy man. But um, your topic is very dear to our heart, and it's people speak about the Newman model not being old-fashioned and not valid, and people speak of the Humboldt model. What's very clear is that they've never read Newman, because Newman wasn't advocating any model at all. He was trying to describe the best he could in terms that are, in my view, entirely legitimate for our times. He was trying to describe the purpose of a university. Now, I've read <coughs> Dr. Kelly's uh, excellent book, if I may say, on the politics of Newman. I've never read Newman trying to understand his politics. Um, and I'm delighted that uh, we can uh, stop now to think about his theology. I'm going to be deprived from having dinner with, with some of you tonight, simply because I'm, I'm sucking on a sweet, as you see, to stop coughing. And I'm still battling this awful cough, cough I've got. But ladies and gentlemen, it's a great delight to have you with us. Thank you for coming to Hope. And your discussions are very dear to our heart. Welcome. I won't keep as much longer, because I know we're all very eager to hear uh, Father Kerr speaking. But I also want to make the point, unless I forget, to thank everyone tonight for attending. It means a lot that you've turned up, and particularly our friends from India. Um, I hope you've had a, a lovely time and experience at this institution. Um, we shouldn't forget, although it's great to have Father Care, we also have uh, a number of speakers who will, be, who will be delivering papers tomorrow also. So I'd like to just draw your attention to those papers tomorrow before we turn to Father Care. A lot of people will have booklets in front of them. Um, tomorrow morning there will be a conference. Uh, the conference will continue in the conference centre, which is outside this building. And it's just let right on my, my right-hand side. Uh, but in the morning we'll begin at half nine. Uh, and uh, Dr. James Piero, former University of Oxter Oxford, will deliver a paper on Ward, Ryder, and the Geo Proxy. Um, then we're honoured to have a friend of mine, Gertan, from the, uh, the Catholic University of Louvain, uh, who will present a paper on Are You Against uh, Unbelief? The Apologetic Perspectives of Newman, Ward, and Manning. Um, that will be then followed by a, a, a paper by uh, an excellent Newman scholar called Stephen Kelly. Um, you might be familiar with him. Um, he will deliver, or I will deliver a paper on Newman and Gladstone's relationship in relation to papal infallibility. And that will be followed by a paper by Father Mansfield, who will look at uh, Newman among the Liberals and Ultramontanes, a uh, personal and theological drama. Finally, the symposium will finish uh, with a paper by Dr. Mark Chapman, who will look at Newman Pusey and the First Vatican Council. Now, Mark is also uh, from the University of Oxford, and we're quite honoured to have him here. Unfortunately, Eric Sindeval couldn't attend, because like uh, Professor Pile, he's quite under the weather at the moment, um, and he has, a, he has a, a, a terrible cold. But now, let me turn to uh, the keynote for tonight, and, and that's in relation to Father Ian Kerr. When I first asked Father Kerr to come to Hope University, I, my, I hoped rather than <coughs> believed um, but I was honoured when he, when he replied to my email and said, yes, Stephen, I would love to come back to this institution. Father Kerr had been here previously, and it gives me great honour tonight that I, can, that I can introduce him once again. I think it's only right that I, I read a brief biography of, of Father Kerr, uh, so we all know how, how prestigious he is, particularly as a Newman scholar. Father Kerr has an MA from Oxford, 
and a PhD from Cambridge. He holds honorary doctorates from Leicester and Toronto University. He has taught both English literature and theology at universities in both the United States and Britain. He is a member of the Oxford Theology faculty and a senior research fellow at Blackfriars. He is the author and editor of over 20 books on Newman. And the first book I ever read in John Henry Newman was Father Ian Kerr's fantastic seminal work, The Biography of, of, of John Henry Newman. Um, he is also the author of The Catholic Revival in English Literature, 1845 to 1961, Mere Catholicism, and most late uh, recently uh, his work on G.K. Uh, G. Chesterton, uh, a biography which was reissued in paperback last year by Oxford University Press. Um, he knows, the man knows no bounds, he continues to publish, and only now he's currently working on a book called, a, a book related to Newman and the Second Vatican Council. So, it is with great honour that I welcome and I hope uh, to listen uh, with intrigue to, to Father Ian Kerr's paper on Newman, the Radical Conservative. Father Ian Kerr. Thank you, Dr. Kelly, for those kind remarks. And it's very nice to be back here at Hope University and to hear that and those inspiring words from the, from the Vice Chancellor. <clears throat> Elected in 1822 to a fellowship at Oriel College, Oxford, then the most academically prestigious of the colleges, John Henry Newman found himself a member of the famous senior common room, which was dominated by the so-called noetics, who emphasized the importance of reason in theology, as opposed to the evangelicals who emphasized scripture and the high church party, which stressed tradition. Under their and other influences, Newman gradually abandoned the evangelicalism to which he had been introduced by a schoolmaster seven years earlier when he was 15. By the end of 1827, he admitted in the Apologia he was drifting in the direction of the liberalism of the day when he was rudely awakened from his dream by two great blows, illness and bereavement. But the, senior, the Oriel Senior Common Room was only the tip of a much, longer, much larger iceberg. In March 1829, Newman identified the threat that the spread of education represented for Christianity. We live in a model era, one in which there is, uh, one in which there is an advance towards universal education. Men have hitherto depended on others and especially on the clergy for religious truth. Now each man attempts to judge for himself. Now without meaning, of course, that Christianity is in itself opposed to free inquiry. Still, I think it in fact at the present time opposed to the particular form which that liberty of thought has now assumed. Christianity is a faith, modesty, lowliness, subordination, but the spirit at work against it is one of latitudinarianism, indifference, republicanism, and schism, a spirit which tends to overthrow doctrine as if the fruit of bigotry and discipline as if the instrument of priestcraft. <coughs> Already four years before the beginning of the Oxford New Movement, Newman sees liberalism as a great enemy and not the evangelicalism that he was abandoning, as has been claimed in the recent bi revisionist study by Frank Turner, John Henry Newman, the challenge uh, to evangelical religion. <coughs> Whatever their deficiencies and limitations about which certainly Newman was unsparing, the truth is that he was by no means simply hostile to evangelicals, but looked, as he put it, most hopefully towards numbers of them. They are a very heterogeneous party, but contain some of the highest and noblest elements of the Christian character among them, which have been attracted to the existing system of seriousness and spirituality, defected as it was, defective as it was, since the time that the low-minded latitudinarians of the previous century robbed the church of all her most beautiful characteristics. It was this want of deeper views that had led to a large portion, Newman wrote, of the deepest and, and truest religious principle being seduced into a school whose spirit admittedly tended to liberalism. So that's Newman's position, um, and I think what Frank Turner argues on, on liberalism and evangelicalism. The, the evangelicalism contained many wonderful elements, although it did, in fact, Newman thought, eventually lead to liberalism. The threat of political interference in the Church of England by reforming Whig or liberal administration, which was to come into power in November 19, 1830, raised questions about the urgent need for internal reforms. But Newman was hostile to any change, attempt to change the liturgy, particularly the damnatory clauses in the Athanasian Creed. If certain parts offend certain minds, is there not, on the other hand, an extreme danger of countenancing the false liberality of the age, which would fain have it believed 
the differences of opinion are of slight consequence. In June 1830, Newman resigned his membership of the Bible Society because it encouraged, as he put it, coming on common ground with dissenters. I do believe it makes churchmen liberals. It makes them feel a wish to conciliate dissenters at the expense of truth. However, the Bible Society was only one manifestation of the tendency of the age towards liberalism. It was the church which was the legitimate enforcement of Christian truth. The liberals know this and are in every possible manner trying to break it up. In March 1831, the new Whig government began passing the Great Reform Act through Parliament. A commission had already been set up to look into ecclesiastical abuses such as pluralism in the established church. The vital question Newman wrote, <coughs> the, 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 the vital question Newman wrote, was were, were we to keep how were we to keep the church from being liberalised? Most English people, Newman thought, did not really believe in Christianity in any true sense, in true meaning of the word. No, they are liberals, and in saying this, I conceive I am saying almost as bad of them as can be said of any man. As the threat to the church grew, Oxford will want hot-headed men, and such I mean to be and I am in my place, exclaimed Newman. And in his place he was when the election to the newly founded Sanskrit chair took place in February 1832, and one of the two candidates, the one who Newman admitted was the best Sanskrit scholar available, H.H. H. Wilson, might be, he suspected, a mere liberal and consider the Sanskrit theology not far inferior to the Christian. The other candidate, W. H. Miller, strict churchman, narrowly lost the election in March in spite of Newman's best efforts, and this, of course, the year before the beginning of the Oxford movement. The year before, Newman had accepted an invitation from the high church Hugh James Rose to contribute a history of church councils to a new library of theological works of which Rose was co-editor. However, at the end of August 1831, he informed Rose that the Eastern councils would need a volume to themselves and that he was now concerned with how to organise the first volume. Newman did not see his work as merely academic research, as in writing it he was resisting, he said, the innovations of the day, in other words, liberalism. In the end, the book turned out to be not a history of the councils or even of the Council of Nicaea, but of the Arian heresy. Unsurprisingly, Rose's co-editor, W.R. Lyle, thought it unsuitable for a theological library which was intended for general readers. Apart from not being the work that had been commissioned, it was too specialised, and there were also theological objections in Lyell's view. Most serious was Newman's treatment of the early church's disciplina arcani, or practice of economy, which implied a, con a concept of tradition that seemed to Lyell directly adverse to that which Protestant writers of our own church have contended for, and too favourable to the Romanist writers. Lyell also objected to Newman's notion of the dispensation of paganism, which he knew was a very common view of the matter in Clement of Alexandria, but which he thought open to very grave objections. And to speak of the, ho of the heathen poets having been divinely illuminated could cast doubt upon the whole doctrine of inspiration, biblical inspiration, of course. Lyell was also uneasy about the way Newman spoke of the backwardness of the fathers to put forward the great and peculiar doctrines of the gospel. He wrote, if it were true that the anti-Nicene fathers had not spoken strongly and openly and frequently about these doctrines, it would be difficult not to believe that they had not interpreted scripture as we do, a supposition that would be almost fatal to the doctrines as it seems to me. Newman's The Arians of the 4th century then was by no means simply the work of a conservative high church Anglican like Lyall, even though, as we have seen, Newman regarded it as directed against the liberals. This was a radical work of theology. Newman was anti-liberal, but he was no mere conservative. In December 1832, Newman set out on a Mediterranean cruise with his friend and colleague at Oriel, Richard Hurrell-Froud and his father. Recalling his thoughts at the time, he was convinced that if liberalism once got a footing in the church, it was sure of victory. On arriving at Algiers, Newman would not even look at the tricolor. The mere sight of the Republican flag reminded him unpleasantly of the success of the liberal cause. In March 1833, he learned of the very comprehensive plan of the latitudinarian Thomas Arnold, a former member of the Oriel Noetic Common Room, 
for reforming the church to avoid the threat of disestablishment posed by the Whig government, whereby all the denominations except the Quakers and Roman Catholics would hold their services in the Anglican parish church. This exclusion of Quakers and Catholics as well as Jews seemed illiberal, Newman commented sarcastically. In January 1834, an inquiry about the Disciplina Arcani or reserve for the primitive church in, in, in inculcating the more sacred doctrines of our faith, about which Newman, as I said, was recent, I said had written in the Arians, elicited a reply that would more, more than have confirmed Lyle's unease about Newman's treatment of tradition. This rule of secrecy, Newman wrote, existed rather as a feeling and a principle than as a rule in the early church. And he goes on. This is the case with the greater part of the theological and ecclesiastical system, which is implicitly contained in the writings and acts of the apostles, but was developed at various times circumstances. I should in a certain sense say this was true of the doctrine of the Trinity and of the Incarnation. So I think one of our speakers tomorrow in a recent book has said that Newman didn't really get the idea of development until around 1841. Here we have a very clear and specific reference, and it's not the only one, uh, to Newman being aware of the development of doctrine as early as 1834. The conservative high church Lyle was clearly fully justified in his unease. Newman, the radical theologian, had already grasped the concept of the development of doctrine. Again in 1834, in one of the early tracts for the Times, Tract 40, which takes the form of a dialogue between a clericus and a laicus, who asks the priest to respond to objections that his religious system, the apostolical, that is called Tractarianism, is in fact popery. The priest, clearly Newman himself, maintains that fresh and fresh articles of faith are necessary to secure the church's purity, according to the rise of successive heresies and errors. These articles are all hidden, as it were, in the church's bosom from the first and brought out into form according to the occasion. When Newman republished the tract in 1877, he added a footnote confirming that here the principle of doctrinal development is accepted as true and necessary for the Christian church. In the autumn of 1835, Newman published, as Tract 73, his article essay on the introduction of rationalistic principles into religion, later republished as on the introduction of rationalistic principles into revealed religion. It was a tract against the latitudinarian or liberal party. Defining rationalism as an abuse of reason, Newman wrote, to rationalize in matters of revelation is to make our reason the standard and measure of the doctrines revealed. But again, Newman is no simple anti-liberal conservative, being careful to allow for a legitimate use of reason, which he contrasts with an illegitimate use. As regards revealed truth, it is not rationalism to set about to ascertain by the use of reason what things are ascertainable by reason and what are not, nor in the absence of an express revelation to inquire into the truths of religion as they come to us by nature, nor to determine what proofs are necessary for the acceptance of a revelation of a revelation if it be given, nor to reject a revelation on the plea of insufficient proof, nor after recognizing it as divine to investigate the meaning of its declarations and to interpret its language. This is not rationalism, but it is rationalism to accept the revelation and then to explain it away, to speak of it as the word of God and to treat it as the word of man, to refuse to let it speak for itself, to claim to be told the why and the how of God's dealings with us and to assign to him a motive and a scope of our own, to stumble at the partial knowledge of what he may give us of them, to put aside what is obscure as if it had not been said at all, to accept one half of what has been told us and not the other half, to assume that the contents of Revelation are also its proof, to frame some gratuitous hypothesis about them, and then to garble, gloss, and color them, to trim, clip, pare away, and twist them, in order to bring them into conformity with the idea to which we have subjected them. Theological liberalism, Newman said, led to the rejection of the idea of mystery. And again, Newman's grasp of the mystery of revelation saves him from any kind of simple dogmatism. Considered as a mystery, revelation, he insists, is a doctrine enunciated by inspiration in human language as the only possible medium of it, and suitably according to the capacity of language, a doctrine lying hid in language to be received in that language. Dogmas are necessary, 
but they cannot fully comprehend the mystery. Such are the limitations of language. A revelation, Newman writes, is religious doctrine viewed on its illuminated side. A mystery is the self-same doctrine viewed on the side unilluminated. Thus, religious truth is neither light nor darkness, but both together. Revelation is not a revealed system, but consists of a number of detached and incomplete truths belonging to a vast system unrevealed of doctrines and injunctions mysteriously connected together. In January 1841, Newman published a review article of the latitudinarian Henry Hart Milman's History of Christianity. Milman had already caused a stir with his History of the Jews in 1829, Newman's response then was again not that of a simple anti-liberal conservative. On the one hand, he thought the book very dangerous and rationalistic. On the other hand, the great evil of the book lay in his view not in the matter of the history, but in the profane spirit in which it is written. For, on, for in most of his positions, I agree with him. It's remarkable. In most of his positions, I agree with him, but, but abhor the irreverent, scoffing, gibbon-like tone of the composition. The book he, he wrote was the fruit of a supercilious liberalistic spirit. As for this new book, while it was undoubtedly true that a great portion of what is generally received as Christian truth is in its rudiments or in its separate parts to be found in heathen philosophies and religions, Milman's conclusion did not follow that these things are in heath heathenism, therefore they are not Christian. <coughs> the right conclusion was rather that these things are in Christianity, therefore they are not heathen. Newman wrote, we prefer to say, and we think the scripture bears us out in saying, that from the beginning the moral governor of the world has scattered the seeds of truth far and wide over its extent, that these have variously taken root and grown up in the wilderness, <coughs> wild plants indeed but living, and hence that as the inferior animals have tokens of an immaterial principle in them, yet have not souls, so the philosophies and religions of men have their life in certain true ideas, though they are not directly divine. What man is amid the brute creation, such is the church among the schools of the world. And as Adam gave names to the animals about him, so has the church from the first looked round upon the earth, noting and visiting the doctrines she found there, claiming to herself what they said rightly, correcting their errors, supplying their defects, completing their beginnings, expanding their surmises, and thus gradually by means of them enlarging the range and refining the sense of her own teaching. Well, it was an eloquent development of what Newman had called in the Arians the dispensation of paganism, namely the point that all religions have elements of truth in them. This was very different from Milliman's assumption that, religion, that revelation was a single entire solitary act introducing a certain message and that Christianity was somewhere tinit or certain principles given at one time in their fullness. Rather, revealed religion was various, complex, progressive, and supplemental of itself. Again, Newman's approach was certainly very different from the wholesale condemnation of Milman's book by conservative churchmen. I might I haven't got time to go into this, but it's interesting to note that uh, I think that what Newman has to say about non-Christian religion is actually religions is actually more advanced. You might say or goes further than what the Second Vatican Council taught in its decree on the relations with non-Christian religions. In his essay on the development of Christian doctrine, published in 1845, immediately prior to his reception into the Roman Catholic Church, Newman quoted this passage from his review of Milman's book as the conclusion to his eighth chapter, ap application of the third note of a true development, assimilative power. Here, as in the review, he maintained that paganism and the heretical Christian sects contained elements of truth amid their error. But heresy was also beneficial to Christianity, as its doctrines are indices and anticipations of the mind of the church. As the first step in settling a question of doctrine is to raise and debate it, so heresies in every age may be taken as a measure of the existing state of thought in the church and of the movement of her theology. They determine in what way the current is setting and the rate at which it flows. The subsequent doctrinal definitions by the church are the true fulfillment of heretical self-willed and abortive attempts at precipitating the growth of the church. The church is able, by means of the continuity and firmness of her principles, to convert the raw material of heresy to her own uses. She alone has succeeded in thus rejecting evil without sacrificing the good. 
There was, Newman thought, a certain virtue of grace in the gospel which changes the quality of doctrines, opinions, usages, actions, and personal characters when incorporated with them, with it and makes them right and acceptable to its divine author. <coughs> Whereas before they were either infected with evil or at best, but the shadows of the truth. Confident then in the power of Christianity to resist the infection of evil and to transmute the very instruments and appendages of demon worship to an evangelical use, <coughs> and feeling also that these usages had originally come from primitive revelations, and again Newman doesn't hesitate to say revelations speaking about pagan religions, from primitive revelations and from the instinct of nature, though they had been corrupted and that they must invent what they needed if they did not use what they found and that they were moreover possessed of the very archetypes of which paganism attempted the shadows. The rulers of the church from early times were prepared, should the occasion arise, to adopt, to imitate, to sanction the existing rites and customs of the populace, as well as the philosophy of the educated class. And so the church was able to convert heathen appointments into spiritual rites and usages. There was no question in Newman's mind of the falsity of paganism and heresy, no question that there was only one true religion and one true church, as he saw it then as an Anglican. But his response was not simply to condemn, like the high church, Lyell. It was a conservative yet radical response that anticipated the teaching, as I've said, although it went further than the teaching of the Second Vatican Council. Well, if Newman is best described theologically in his Anglican years as a radical conservative, what of Newman the Catholic? I would like to look, first of all, at Newman's first substantial Catholic theological work, because he hadn't intended after uh, his conversion to write about theology. Um, but in 1859, he wrote a famous article, as you may have heard of, called On Consulting the Faithful in Matters of Doctrine. That's his first substantial theological work, the beginning of a development of his Catholic ecclesiology. On Consulting the Faithful in Matters of Doctrine was republished in 1961, just over 100 years later on the eve of the opening of the Second Vatican Council. Um, there's a preface by the former Archbishop of Liverpool, Archbishop Warlock. Incidentally. The editor, John Coulson, takes it for granted that the faithful are synonymous with the laity. He writes, not only is the existence of a lively and educated laity fundamental to his, that's Newman's, conception of the Catholic Church and to its theology, but the most, <coughs> the most fruitful approach to his work is to see it as a developing theology of the laity in all its ramifications. Coulson alternates between the words faithful and laity as though they were the same. Nor does he distinguish the bishops, with whom the article is really concerned, from the clergy, as when he speaks of Newman's asking for the fullness of the church to be made manifest, for that fullness which is not in the priests alone, but only in the conspiratio of priests and faithful laity. In his book, Newman and the Common Tradition, a study in the language of church and society, where he reproduces the substance of, his intro of this introduction, Coulson sees Newman as protesting against the churches being conceived as divided into two castes, the clerical or dynamic element and the lay <laughs> or passive element. Coulson's emphasis is on the words dynamic and passive, but the question is whether, in fact, Newman did conceive of the church as fundamentally divided into the clerical and lay castes, to use Coulson's word. The truth is <clears throat> that in the essay, the article, Newman equivocates in the sense that sometimes he speaks in scriptural and patristic terms and sometimes in the language of a later clericalized church. <laughs> that is a church that is seen as primarily divided into clergy and laity. From his study of the Greek fathers uh, as an Anglican, Newman had learned that the church is primarily the communion of those who received the gift of the Holy Spirit in baptism, as the Second Vatican Council in Lumen Gentium affirms. But he was living in the Tridentine church of the 19th century, a church that was conceived of as divided into the teaching, docens, and taught, doctor church, a church in which the faithful do not include the pastors, to say the bishops and priests. Numa's quoting here the leading Roman theologian of the day, Giovanni Peroni, in order to point out that even Peroni acknowledges that the laity possess a sensus fidelium which witnesses to the apostolic tradition. And Newman quotes Pope Pius IX in his bull of 1844, 1854 
defining the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, in which the Pope refers to the belief of the faithful as one of the witnesses to the apostolicity of the doctrine. The two, the church teaching and the church taught, this is Newman, are put together as one twofold testimony, illustrating each other and never to be divided. To prove that the voice of tradition may express itself not by councils, nor fathers, nor bishops, but the, but the communis fidelium census, Newman turns to that period of history which he knew so well from his first book, The Fourth Century. And he proceeds to show how the Nicene dogma was maintained during the greater part of the fourth <coughs> century, not by the unswerving firmness of the Holy See, councils, or bishops, but by the consensus fidelium. We're not concerned now with the historical accuracy of what Newman has to say, but we're concerned with the, the theological aspect of this. Newman writes, it's not a little remarkable that though historically speaking the fourth century is the age of doctors, illustrated as it was by the saints Athanasius, Hilary, the two Gregories, Basil, Chrysostom, Ambrose, Jerome, and Augustine, and all of these saints bishops also except one, nevertheless in that very day the divine tradition submitted to the infallible church was proclaimed and maintained far more by the faithful than by the episcopate. In the passage of explanation that follows, it is noteworthy that Newman does not put the faithful laity on the one side and the unfaithful clergy on the other, as Coulson would have it. On the contrary, Newman writes, there were numbers of clergy who stood by the laity and acted as their centres and guides. Newman does not represent the clergy but the bishops as failing to uphold the orthodox doctrine. He writes, in that time of immense confusion, the divine dogma of our Lord's divinity was proclaimed, enforced, maintained, and humanly speaking, preserved far more by the ecclesia doctor than by the ecclesia docens, that the body of the episcopate was unfaithful to its commission, while the body of the laity was faithful to its baptism. Later in the article, when Newman sets out his historical evidence from the 4th century, we learn that in Nicopolis there was a remarkable unanimity of clergy and people in rejecting the Arian bishop. The second point that is very striking is Newman's use of the word laity. The very first of the texts he cites as proofs of the fidelity of the laity, to use his words, speaks about the Arian bishops physically attacking the holy virgins and brethren, those who would now be called religious, who are not normally classed among the laity. Well, there's a confusion, actually, between the Western and Eastern codes of canon law. That's not a point we need to go into this evening. Later, in the same text of Athanasius, the word virgins is again italicized to indicate that this is evidence for the fidelity of the laity. These are what we today would call nuns or sisters. Again, in the third of Newman's examples of the laity's fidelity, monasteries and monks are similarly italicized. In the fifth proof text, Flavian and Diodorus, who had embraced the ascetical life, or in other words were monks, are explicitly classed in the ranks of the laity, since they were not as yet in the sacred ministry. Finally, when Newman came to republish the Arians of the 4th century in the uniform edition of his works, he added a note in the appendix in which he republished part of the 1859 article with some amendments and some additions, including this sentence, which begins with the remarkable words. In speaking of the laity, I speak inclusively of their parish priests. Doesn't make sense, does it? I speak inclusively of their parish priests, at least in many places, but we are obliged to say that the governing body of the church came short. This sentence makes two things, it seems to me, abundantly clear. First, that when Newman uses the word laity, he is really speaking of the faithful, that is, those who are full of faith, whether they be lay people, religious, or priests. Second, that it is the failure of the bishops, not the clergy, with which the article is concerned. The idea that on consulting the faithful in matters of doctrine is a kind of tract vindicating the rights of the laity in a clericalized church is simply not supported by the text. It is true, of course, that the article arose out of the English bishops' refusal to consult with the laity about the Royal Commission on Primary Education. But once Newman steps back into the world of the fourth century, long before clericalization had, introduced, had produced the concept of a church divided into clergy and laity, he is back in the kind of church that St. Paul describes in his letter to the Corinthians. Now you together are Christ's body, but each of you is a different part of it. In the church, God has given the first place to apostles, the second to prophets, the third to teachers, after them miracles, and after them the gift of healing, helpers, good leaders, those with many languages. 
Since the Second Vatican Council, Newman has been regularly cited by liberal Catholics as a champion of what amounts to the laicization as opposed to the clericalization of the Church. But the text of the 1859 article, the title of which is not on consulting the laity, but on consulting the faithful, shows that Newman's ecclesiology is a great deal more radical than that 19th century ecclesiology, which ironically is shared by many modern liberal Catholics that defines the church in terms of clergy and laity. It is a radical ecclesiology because it is rooted in the sources of the tradition, in the New Testament and the Fathers, as the opening two chapters of Lumen Gentium, the Vatican II's constitution of the church are. During April, May, and June 1864, Newman published in eight pamphlets his Apologia Pro Vita Sua, in the last chapter of which he adumbrated a theology of authority and freedom in the church. On the one hand, he was confronted with liberal Catholics like Acton and Simpson demanding theological freedom, and on the other hand, by his ultramontane fellow Oxford converts, uh, the, uh, the convert, the future Cardinal Manning, uh, the few converts, the future Cardinal Manning, who of course was to be one of the principal advocates of the definition of papal infallibility in 1870, and W. G. Ward, who had recently published a pamphlet condemning religious freedom. Newman's response was that both freedom and authority are necessary, and that paradoxically a vibrant theology requires the boundaries and limitations of authority. The tension between authority and freedom is potentially creative rather than stultifying. Thus, Newman is, is uncompromisingly insistent that the Church's infallibility is intended to restrain that freedom of thought, which of course in itself is one of the greatest of our natural gifts, and to rescue it from its own suicidal excesses. And although infallibility only pertains strictly to solemn dogmatic definitions, nevertheless, Newman calls for respect for those other decisions of the Holy See, theological or not, which come to me with a claim to be accepted and obeyed. To the objection that if so, then the restless intellect of our common humanity is utterly weighed down, so it is brought into order only to be destroyed, Newman's response is that on the contrary, the energy of the human intellect thrives and is joyous with a tough elastic strength under the terrible blows of the divinely fashioned weapon and is never so much itself as when it has been lately been overthrown. Now, Newman here is not talking about a dialogue between authority and, and theology, but a creative conflict. He writes, it is the vast Catholic body itself and only which affords an arena for both combatants in that awful, never-dying duel. After all, the Church can only define infallibly as a result of the work of theologians, of an intense and varied operation of the reason, Newman calls it, both as its ally and provokes again when it has done its work a reaction of reason against it, as theologians set to work to interpret the meaning of a definition and to determine its limits and scope. Infallibility does not mean, says Newman, that the parties who are in possession of it are in all their proceedings infallible. History supplies us with instances in the church where legitimate power has been harshly used. Nevertheless, Newman is quick to add, it does not follow that the substance of the acts of the ruling power is not right and expedient, because the manner may have been faulty. Indeed, he says, authority has been mainly in the right, and this is true even when theology proposes what will eventually become a truth accepted by the church. For his reading of church history as an Anglican had shown, it seemed to Newman, that the initial error of what afterwards became heresy was the urging forward some truth against the prohibition of authority at an unseasonable time. The proof that infallibility has not stifled intellectual freedom in the church, Newman claims, it is, is that it is individuals and not the Holy See that have taken the initiative and given the lead to the Catholic mind in theological inquiry. Indeed, he writes, and of course this is provocative, provocatively in face of the ultramontanes, indeed, Newman writes, it is one of the reproaches against the Roman church, that's to say the church of Rome, the local church of Rome, or the papal church, that it has originated nothing and has only served as a sort of break in the development of doctrine. Even ecumenical councils, Newman points out, were guided by the individual reason of theologians. Newman points out that paradoxically there never was a time when the, inte the intellect of the educated class was more active or rather more restless than in the Middle Ages. History showed how slow authority was in interfering and how it was only after discussion and controversy among theologians 
and judgment by a bishop that a matter would come before the Holy See, only after it had been ventilated and turned over and over again and viewed on every side of it that authority is called upon to pronounce a decision which has already been arrived at by reason. However, Newman himself, of course, was living in an ultramontane church in which Rome, as he put it, was watching every word uttered by a theologian, and theological freedom had indeed been crushed, as he implies in this imaginary but very real scenario. Still, he admits, it is true that when controversies run high, then an interposition may advis advisably take place, and again questions may be of that urgent nature that an appeal must be made at once to the highest authority of the church. And, of course, Newman is writing at a time when the beginning of the mass uh, media uh, and when, of course, views could be circulated very widely around the world very quickly and were not just in the local church but would be, be soon be seen on the Internet and so on. In 1877, Newman republished his Anglican lectures on the prophetical office of the church together with a lengthy new preface. He wanted to correct his mistake in blaming corruptions in the church on Catholic theology. Ambition, he writes, craft, cruelty, and superstition are not commonly the characteristic of theologians, but in fact bear on their face the marks of having a popular or political origin. And theology, so far from encouraging them, has restrained and corrected such extravagances as have been committed in the exercise of the regal and sacerdotal powers. Uh, Newman is imagining the church with having the three offices of Christ, priest, prophet, and king, the worshipping church, the prophetic or the theological church and the regal church, that's to say, the ruling church of the Pope and bishops, though he doesn't actually curiously mention bishops, perhaps because of the recent definition of papal infallibility. And, and theology, says Newman, so far from encouraging them, has restrained and corrected such extravagances as have been committed. Oh, sorry, I've just read that. Indeed, Newman writes, the church was never in greater danger than when the schools of theology had been broken up and ceased to be. And this is a very important passage in the preface, uh, which is regularly quoted by people, uh, but we're going to have put aside that something else that Newman says. I say then, theology is the fundamental and regulating principle of the whole church system. It is commensurate with revelation, and revelation is the initial and essential idea of Christianity. It is the subject matter, the formal cause, the expression of the prophetical office, and as being such has created both the regal office and the sacerdotal. That's to say, the ruling church and the worshipping church. And it has, in a certain sense, the power of jurisdiction over these offices as being its own creations. Theologians ever being ever in request and in employment in keeping within bounds both the political and popular elements in the church's constitution, elements which are more congenial than itself to the human mind, are far more liable to excess and corruption. Now, in this passage, which is so often quoted, Newman seems to be speaking with the liberal voice of the liberal Catholic magazine, The Rambler, which, of course, Acton and Newman were connected with, and which Newman himself got involved, which is why he came to write that 1859 article on consulting the faithful in matters of doctrine. So he seems here to be speaking with a kind of liberal voice that would have provoked and offended the ultramontanes. But now another voice is heard, and this is always so important in dealing in treating with this. So many people write about Newman, quote one thing, but they don't quote the other. So the, so this, but Newman has another voice. Yet Newman writes, theology cannot always have its own way. It is too hard, too intellectual, too exact to be always equitable or to be always compassionate. Popular religion may, for example, reject a more accurate translation of the Bible because to the devotional mind what is new and strange is as repulsive, often as dangerous, as falsehood is to the scientific. More seriously, there was the possibility of a conflict between religious inquiry or teaching and investigation in purely secular matters. There was, Newman writes, a modern assumption that whenever there was an apparent and only apparent contradiction between religion and science, then religion must immediately give way. But even though, he argues, Galileo was right in his conclusion that the earth moves, and though it might have been wrong to condemn him as a heretic, nevertheless, there was nothing wrong in censoring abrupt, startling, unsettling, unverified disclosures when the limits of revealed truth had not as yet been verified. Newman finds the contrast between theology and popular religion in the Gospels themselves, citing the case of the woman with the hemorrhage who hoped to be cured by touching the cloak of Jesus, who passed over the superstitious act and healed her because of her faith. In fact, he praised her for what might not without reason be called an idolatrous act. Indeed, in the Gospels, the idolatry of ignorance, Newman says, is superior to other idolatries, that of wealth, for example, 
which, however, are not commonly startling or shocking to educated minds. Where was there an instance of Jesus condemning superstition? But such an instance in the Gospel, of course, Newman also points out, form an aspect of the apostolic Christianity very different from that presented by the epistles of St. Paul. Uh, the, the late Cardinal Dulles, I mean, an important essay on this article, uh, point out, of course, that the Second Vatican Council, the Constitution of the Church, is not concerned with the, um, the tensions between the different parts of the Church. And uh, Newman, of course, is writing as a theologian, is very pragmatic. But I think there'll be an example, a recent example, we could have bear in mind what Newman is saying is, of course, the case of the Lefebvre schism, because, as you know, uh, it was many years before finally Pope John Paul II excommunicated Archbishop Lefebvre and the bishops that he had consecrated, because, of course, that was seen as a, a deliberately as a schismatic act. Uh, setting church against church. But it's interesting, the Holy See desisted for many years from acting uh, more severely against the Lefebvre's. And I, and I think it's a good example of what Newman's saying here, because on the one hand, the Lefebvre's were clearly in conflict with the theological office of the church, because they were rejecting the Second Vatican Council. And they were clearly also in conflict with the regal office of the church, insofar as they were uh, disobeying papal commands and uh, disobeying the Holy See. But nevertheless, I imagine the Holy See, to the Pope, took in mind the uh, the popular, the worshipping element, and a lot of people were very upset about what happened in the liturgy. People were very extremely upset, and of course there have been many abuses on the other side in the, in the, new, in the vernacular mass. And so I, I think this is a good example of what Newman's saying, is this conflict between the offices, and in this case, the Pope, uh, or Popes, because it's really begun under Paul VI, the Pope, the Popes cho chose to give a certain leeway, hoping, of course, that Lefebvre would come back, but giving leeway because of the importance of the worshipping church and that many of these fo the followers of Lefebvre were people who were very upset that they had lost uh, the Tridentine Mass. Well, finally, in 1878, Newman delivered in Rome his famous Biglietto speech following his elevation to the College of Cardinals. He began by referring to the many trials he had suffered, a clear reference to his persecution by the Ultramontanes for his alleged liberal Catholicism. In fact, he, 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 in fact, he insisted the one great mischief he had opposed from the first was the spirit of liberalism in religion. Liberalism in religion, he, wrote, he, he said, is the doctrine that there is no positive truth in religion, but that one creed is as good as another. It is inconsistent with any recognition of any religion as true. It teaches that all are to be tolerated, for all are matters of opinion. Revealed truth is not a truth, but a sentiment and a taste, not an objective fact. But, and this is the important point that I want to make, Newman doesn't hesitate in the heart of papal Rome. It's true there's a new pope, but still very dominated by the Ultramontanes. He doesn't hesitate in the heart of papal Rome to introduce this important modification to what he's just said about his lifelong resistance to liberalism. He writes, he says, there is much in the liberalistic theory which is good and true, those are provocative words. There's much in the liberalistic theory which is good and true. For example, the precepts of justice, truthfulness, which he didn't think were characteristics, uh, certainly under Pius IX had been characteristics of the Church of Rome. But then it is precisely because of the positive side of liberalism, then Newman goes on to make it, <laughs> turn it away, there never was a device of the enemy so cleverly framed and with such promise of success. Well, having abandoned the attempt as a Tractarian Anglican to construct, construct a via media or middle way between Rome and Geneva, Newman found that he had to forge another via media as a Catholic between the ultramontane and liberal wings of the church. Neither simply conservative nor liberal, Newman is best described again as a radical conservative or conservative reformer. Thank you very much. fantastic paper, Father Kerr. Um, you're a master of weaving the title, the subject matter, into the paper, and to the very beginning and very end, you achieve that. Um, I suppose we have 15 minutes or so for questions, uh, and I'd, 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 I'd ask anyone who, who's willing to offer Father Kerr a question, please uh, raise your hand. John. Thank you very much for your illuminating, I thought, carefully nuanced talk. There was a figure you mentioned in passing a couple of times, uh, a Catholic lay historian, John Acton. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wonder whether you could cast light on the relationship between him and John Henry Newman, because th there are aspects of John Acton and Newman that I would have thought would have brought them together. From my understanding, they increasingly became distant. 
Yes. Well, yes, I mean, of course, it brings out uh, the, the whole business of the Rambler, Newman's attitude to the Rambler magazine. Because on the one hand, he was very favorable to Acton and Simpson. Acton was the proprietor, and of course, Simpson was the first editor. And he was very sympathetic to, uh, for example, their, their views on religious freedom. Because again, we have to remember that uh, uh, the upset that was caused by the, the, the thing that Archbishop Lefebvre particularly objected to was a declaration on religious freedom. And it wasn't something that bothered Catholics in here in English speaking countries, obviously. But on the continent, it was seen to be uh, a volte farce, a complete contradiction of what the 19th century popes had consistently taught. And it was a source of anxiety, for instance, to Pope John Paul II as a bishop at the, at the council. Um, so on the one hand, Newman was, uh, uh, Newman was very sympathetic to what they were doing, but he also thought that they ought not to be uh, defiant of authority and that they ought certain th uh, theological points they were making was better for the, what, what, that they weren't made in the magazine. So it was a nuanced position. But of course, gradually, um, and I don't know, you're probably sure you know more about Acton than me, but of course, gradually he drifted in the direction of Derlinger, didn't he? And of course, Newman was very, very critical of Derlinger and said he's like a Protestant, uh, he appeals to, like Protestant appeals to scripture against the church. So Derlinger appeals to history against the church. Of course, you had the same thing happening after Vatican II, because essentially what Archbishop Lefebvre did was to appeal to tradition against the church. <laughs> um, so um, they obviously drew apart. But there's a, very, there's, a, there's a very nice letter by Acton where he's right there, I think it must be to Simpson, where he's saying that, that finally Newman unburdens him. He's staying at the Birmingham Oratory, and Newman finally unbuttons himself, he puts it, finally expresses his views, and he's astonished that Newman is so <coughs> open about his, um, his critical, critical attitude towards the ultramontanes. So, I mean, on the one hand, he was very sympathetic, but he thought they went too far, you know, that they, and, that, and that, of course, that they provoked the ultramontanes and spoilt the, what, what Newman, of course, saw as the, as, as the approach they should have taken, which was to, uh, for instance, uh, well, to be critical of the bishops, clearly, for refusing to take part in the Royal Commission on Primary Education because Catholic schools were being financed by the state. It was a suicidal act, really, not to allow uh, inspectors into Catholic schools. Um, but on the other hand, that they ought to be much more careful when it came to theology because Newman thought they, they, they weren't trained theologians, so they needed to be careful. So, but, they, but, of course, at the end of the day, Acton thought Newman was a coward, yes. But it wasn't because Newman was just deferential to authority. That is not, I, don't, I mean, I really don't think you can argue that. I mean, when you think about what that letter he wrote to Bishop Alathorn, which, of course, was made public, mm -hmm. uh, and when you think about what he wrote to, um, to Monsignor Talbot, who had the ear of the Pope, Pius IX, you know, that famous letter where he, Talbot invites him to preach in Rome and Newman writes back saying, Birmingham people have souls too. I mean, Newman was, uh, there, was there was no kowtowing, really, at all. But what he did, but he did think that the authority had its rights, you see. And even when the bishops were wrong, that they had to be, some respect had to be paid to their teaching authority. Anyone else? <coughs> Just a parallel with Newman's relationship to the British critic and the Rambler in a way, both in different ways, the fall in the side of the church, respected of England and the Catholic Church separated by some years, and it's just his role there, he had an editorial role, and then mm -hmm. he was slightly you know, distant from uh, Ward and Oakley, mm -hmm. and we do get something, you know, the issues change um, a bit later with the Rambler, and I just, just, just really a reflection, really a thought, really, not much a question, but uh, that same, how we can think of it, again, as a radical conservative, mm. in these... Well, it's a good parallel, I hadn't thought of it, it's a good parallel, because... His objections to W. G. Ward was, in a sense, well, of course, W. G. Ward was to become one of the leading Ultramontanes, the two, him and Manning. Uh, but of course, even as an Anglican, Newman disapproved of him and that he was going too far and too extreme and, and too provocative. So it is a similar situation. And he, and he was going out of the way to provoke the Anglican bishops. Hmm. Anyone else like to ask a question? May I ask? Sorry, can, I, can I hazard a question as someone from the world of English literature rather than... Well, I used to belong to that yes, world. Do so. <laughs> <laughs> you think um, Newman could belong to something like a, a radical conservative literary tradition, maybe including Belloc and Chesterton? Do you think he could belong to it? Yes, could you place him into a literary tradition? Well, I did write a book some years ago that Dr. Kelly referred to uh, on the... Um, what it was called... Uh, I'd originally entitled the book... Um, 
papists in English literature, but it was published by the University of Notre Dame Press in America. And Americans don't have our kind of sense of humour. And they thought, they thought it was anti-Catholic, you see. And so they did, so I had a rather dull title, The Catholic Revival in English Literature, 1845 to 1961. 1961, where war, even war brings out the last of his trilogy. And of course, the year before the council, it was really quite a co- I, mean, I suddenly realised this was the year that the, the church disappeared, uh, the year before the church, uh, the year, sorry, the, it was the next year the church that war loved so much was to to a large extent, disappear. Um, but yes, there's a chapter in Newman on it. I have him in that tr- tradition. Uh, Newman, Cheston, Belloc, uh, 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 War, and Green. I think I've left somebody out, haven't I? Hopkins. Mm-hmm. Is this perhaps where the radical conservative might go beyond Catholicism, perhaps, mm-hmm. and actually be a kind of literary position, which might also include something like Cobbett? Or yes, yes, what, I don't quite know what you mean by radical conservative in the literary um, I mean, those people who uh, might connect themselves back to an old style of England, perhaps the countryside, back to a pre-industrial world, Mm -hmm. and yet at the same time offer up rather challenging views about society, and indeed just to connect yourself back to um, a medieval world, maybe include the Victorian kind of medievalism, Mm -hmm. Ruskin, and that as well. Just to connect myself back to that world, as mm-hmm. itself to challenge mm-hmm. um, capitalism, mm-hmm. free society, and be a troublemaker. Well, I suppose you could, you could argue that Cambridge the critic was now, though there's a certain amount now being written about him. F.R. Leavis stood in that tradition, didn't he? Yeah. I mean, appealing to the past, but also dealing, of course, with what he saw as the, the evils of the present. Um, because uh, one, of the, one of the big cultural, ch- sort of big, uh, how to put this, the trouble with Leavis, for instance, was that he didn't know, he, he wasn't, uh, because he was so close to the Victorian era, you know, I don't know if you know his, you know his book, The Great Tradition, I don't know if it's still read, but you remember he has a, he puts Dickens in an appendix and says the only novel of Dickens worth reading is Hard Times, because <laughs> he found in Hard Times a message that he approved of. But the truth of the matter is that Leavis, Leavis had Dickens read out to him by his father as a boy, and so he sort of tended to dismiss Dickens, you see. And of course, later on, he recanted, although without admitting it, that in fact, Dickens, of course, is one of our two great writers, along with Shakespeare, there's no question about that, um, and certainly the greatest English novelist. Um, but there was this kind of uh, an ignorance about the Victorian period, I would think, which, which characterized that generation. You know, I, I don't, does it make sense what I'm trying to say? So people like Ruskin, and, well, of course, he was aware of Arnold, that's true, but, but there was a kind of ignorance. You see, I don't think, I don't believe us ever mentioned Newman. It would be very interesting to know what he thought about Newman. Uh, Raymond Williams, who uh, was not a disciple of Leavis, but belonging to the same Cambridge era, uh, he brings Newman into his book, Culture and Society, which was, I don't know if anyone reads it today, but it was very influential in his day, and has a chapter on Newman uh, where he criticizes Newman for not using the word uh, culture in the idea of university. Well, Newman doesn't use the word, he does use it once, meaning cultivation of the mind, but um, because he wanted to avoid the Arnoldian sense, he wasn't talking about the Arnoldian sense of culture, which is to, to read and to know the best that has been put forward, which of course means, you know, being knowledgeable about literature and, and paintings and music and so on. And it wasn't that, that's not what he's talking about in the idea of university, so I'm getting way off the point. Yes, so just following that, and sort of thinking about the literature too, which I mean, sort of tractarianism and how over the century, so if, you know, what Newman was part of that has been characterised as that kind of thing, isn't it? Like John Chilton Reed in that glorious battle, where he basically says it's a kind of countercultural movement in a lot of ways. That's to say, the way it kind of brings together conservatism and radicalism mm-hmm. is socially determined, even though, of course, it's a debate about religion. Mm-hmm. Um, but actually, part of it is that notion of, you know, we are, you know, the prevailing wind is liberalism, and mm-hmm. our, our social rebellion mm-hmm. is going to. So really just to to that yes, of course, rad- it was a radical movement in its, in, in its time, yes, indeed, yes. Um, anyone, anyone else like to offer a question? Yes. Um, yeah, I just wanted if you could elucidate a bit more on Newman's conservative. So yeah. So mm-hmm. If I understand, if, I mean, if I've understand, understood you correctly about his radicality, mm-hmm. his ability to always come up with new ideas, and his incredible mm-hmm. intellectual sophistication, mm-hmm. the way that he come up with new ways of expressing his agenda, mm-hmm. Do you think his conservatism was an instinctive, just a dislike of change? Or do you think it's actually a, a theological commitment to the truth and what's true and authentic? 
Oh, it's, not, it's not an aversion to change. I don't know if you know the uh, was famous speech given in 2005 by Pope Benedict the 16th to Roman Curia, when he speaks about the hermeneutic of, of um, he's speaking about the Second Vatican Council, and he says the the the, the years since the council had been dominated in the church by this conflict between, on the one hand, those who believe see Vatican II in rupture with the past or tradition, and on the other hand, those who understand Vatican II to be a reforming uh, council, but a, but a reforming in continuity. And he goes on, I'm not sure if it's that speech, or maybe it's another one, where he says that the church has to change to remain the same. And it's exactly the point Newman makes at the beginning of the essay on development of doctrine, uh, Christian doctrine, where he says <coughs> Christianity has to change in order to remain the same. So there he's making a, a point, which is exactly the point, that, it, that, <laughs> that it's conservative, it remains the same, but it has to change in order to remain the same. Hmm. Well, anything that anything that Newman felt was an attack upon the objective. See, Newman, in many ways, is very postmodern. I mean, a lot, a lot of postmodern people writing today uh, have an interest in people like, uh, well, I could not mention any names, but um, but uh, but at the same time, he's always very insistent that there was an objective truth and any threat to revelation he resisted. But again, coming back to that dispensation of paganism, that was a remarkable phrase to use because it suggests a covenant, doesn't it? It's just a covenant, you know. And and, and of course, it's not surprising the Anglican, at least one of the two Anglican editors. Um, took fright. This was very, very radical. As I say, it goes beyond what the Second Vatican Council says. I just want to follow up a small question. Mm -hmm. Is the idea of Newman having um, orchestrating a Catholic via Medea? Orchestrating a Catholic? Catholic via Medea yeah. Yeah. in his final decades. Is that, is that your face or is it something that he acknowledged himself? No, he never acknowledged that, no, but, but that's, that effectively is what he was doing, of course. And it was a via media, which again, you know, he wasn't successful in until the very end when he was finally made a cardinal and was rehabilitated. But of course, it was a via media that he clung to rather perilously. Um, I mean, he had very little support, you know, because it was, and it was really only, I suppose, when, of course, they say it was the Second Vatican Council finally vindicated him. Because even up until the Council, you know, in um, the, the, the manuals that were used in Catholic seminaries, Numa's essay on development doctrine was referred to as, you know, the people, uh, well, I can't remember the Latin words were, that it should be. Uh, viewed with caution, <laughs> it's dangerous. But you can say, of course, the only the only example of direct influence on the Second Vatican Council is in the is in the um, is a decree on, um, on, on revelation, uh, De Verbum, uh, where uh, there's a, where there were reference to development, which is which is almost certainly comes from it was Yves Congar, the French theologian, and it comes straight out in Newman clearly. <clears throat> so another point, actually, is in, in we try to put definitions and everything to understand it, but uh, <coughs> himself has said, you call me liberal or you can call me anti-liberal. Um, so sometimes putting preconceived ideas of what liberalism was or what it wasn't um, can cause conflict as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know off my own writings on Newman and politics. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, he was never a conservative put in terms of his political orientation, but his arguments was he a liberal. He sat in the middle, similar mm -hmm. to what Father mm -hmm. Karen was trying mm -hmm. to articulate in terms of his theological views and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and as a Catholic. Um, has anyone else got any? Because there's a rather, rather good book by I don't know if you know Avery Dulles's little book in the think as I thought it was called a series on Newman, and it's very good until you get to the last yeah. chapter, where Dulles goes completely haywire and says that Newman was very very conservative, you know, yeah. and would again been against all these things. It's complete nonsense. Newman was against the temporal power, which in those days was considered it was considered essential to the papacy, to the integrity of the papacy, uh, to advocate uh, the to the abolition of the temporal power or the loss of the temporal power was tantamount to heresy. Um, and when you think too what he says about religious freedom, you know, and uh, not, not until um, well, nearly a hundred years later, the church finally accepts uh, religious freedom. But but, um, but again, that was very very radical. Again, he thought that it was a great mistake for the church in Italy to be established. He thought that he was in favour of disestablishment. He would have been in favour of disestablishment as an Anglican, except he was afraid that if the Church of England was allowed to gather together in what's now, of course, the General Synod, that all kinds of horrible things might happen. <laughs> but um, and, and, and again, he came round to democracy. You know, yeah. this was this was the, this was what the age was. So Dulles is completely wrong about all yeah, that. He referred to him as the consistent Tory. Sorry, he, Dulles referred to Newman as the consistent Tory. Yes, that's quite that's nonsense. Yeah, but in the eighteen twenties, you mentioned Newman's trip to the Algar. He referred to to, to um, the democracy as, as the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. But he had a complete conversion mm -hmm. by the eighteen by the eighteen. Well, well, he was a pragmatic, and, and yeah. times had changed. Exactly. You know, whether you liked it or not. I mean, he might have had a nostalgia for the old the old system, but he knew. And the church has to adapt; otherwise, it otherwise it will be destroyed. 
and he saw in Italy it was very counterproductive having the church established, you know, and particularly in the papal states, as he said, where the pope has to be protected against his own subject by the subjects by the bayonets of mercenaries, <laughs> which was the situation, of course. And it's not surprising that belt of Italy is, was long the was a big communist stronghold in Italy after the war was exactly that papal belt where, of course, anti-clericalism flourished. Uh, has anyone else got any questions? Okay, I think we'll, we'll leave it there. The one point I'd like to make, and it was Doc, our father Kerr made this point to me a few years ago, and, and it's coming through in his paper tonight. He said, Stephen, he read a draft of one of my chapters, and he was critical of the chapter, and he was right to be. And he said, Stephen, the problem here is you're not letting Newman speak. Listen to Newman, read Newman's works, read Newman's letters and diaries. And that's very important to scholars. And I think that was articulated very well tonight in, in Father Kerr's paper. Listen to Newman and listen to what he has to say. Um, I'd like to just hope to, uh, to thank Father Kerr once again for his uh, magnificent uh, uh, keynote address. Uh, and I'd like to, all, to invite you all outside for a keen coffee and some biscuits. Um, so can we give a, a round of applause to Father Kerr? <laughs>